right, welcome everyone. I am Professor Lisa Leslie, and I wanna welcome you to the first Faculty Insights event of the spring 2021 semester. I am delighted to be hosting this series this spring along with my colleague, Professor Julian Yao. Professor Yao, you wanna say hello? Sure. Hello everyone, welcome to our first event. We're very excited about our lineup of speakers today and on coming Mondays. I'll hand you back to Professor Leslie who will tell you more about our series. All right, so the theme for the spring is current and future trends. Each week, we're gonna have one or two faculty experts to talk here, who are gonna be here with us to talk about an important business trend, where it has been and perhaps make some bold speculations about where it may be going. I'm pleased to introduce our first set of faculty experts who'll be speaking to you today about the future of New York City real estate. First, we have Professor R. Pete Gupta. Professor Gupta holds a PhD in finance and economics from Columbia and has been a member of the Stern Finance Department since 2016. His research focuses on using big data to understand financial decisions, including those that involve real estate. Today, he'll be talking to us about the future of residential real estate in New York. Next, we have Professor Sam Chandon, who holds a Silverstein Chair in Real Estate Development and Investment and is a Dean of NYU Shack Institute of Real Estate. He also runs Chandon Economics, which is an economic advisory and data science firm that focuses on real estate industry. Today, he'll be talking about the future of commercial real estate. In terms of format, Professors Gupta and Chandon are going to present for about 20 minutes. After that, I'll moderate about 10 minutes of Q&A from the audience. So if you have a question, uh, please submit that to me during the presentations using the chat. I really more than welcome your questions and I'll select a few to pose to our experts uh, once their presentations are over. After the Q&A, we're also gonna provide some discussion questions. You have about 30 minutes to socialize and have some further discussion around this topic uh, with some of your peers. And I'll say a little more about what that's gonna look like when we get to that point. So without further ado, I would like to turn things over to Professors Gupta and Chandan. We are really delighted that you're here and excited to hear what you have to say about the future of real estate. Thanks so much, Lisa. So I am a professor of real estate here at NYU and I teach uh, real estate capital markets. And over the last year, I've been really thinking a lot about how this pandemic has affected all of us and how it's going to shape the future of the real estate industry. So let's first talk about where we've been. So one data source I've been using a lot comes from mobile phone geolocation data, which allows us to track the location of individuals and how they've moved across the pandemic. So this is using signals from your cell phones to track the precise latitude longitude of individuals to track where exactly people have been going over the course uh, of this year. So this plot here on the left shows the fraction of people that remain in their home borough over the course of March, April, May, June, and July. And really the big takeaway is that as soon as this pandemic hit, you know, right about a year ago, we saw about 15% of the population of Manhattan flee, basically overnight, heading for other areas. You can see a further geographic breakdown of that flight here on the right with the more red zip codes indicating greater flight. So right around our neighborhood, we saw basically 40, 50% of people actually leave the city. So if you happen to be here over this time, the city probably looked a little bit emptier. And this is exactly why, because this onset of the pandemic brought kind of the first big shock to the real estate market, which was this immediate exodus of individuals um, as the pandemic really kind of hit and as our city became the epicenter for this pandemic across the country. Here is kind of how prices have evolved, residential prices have evolved in the area since that time. So in the plot here on the left, you know, the further the green the area is, the greater the prices have gone up, and the more red it is, the more prices have gone down. So this is probably kind of similar to what your impressions have been, which is that there is this really, you know, big, massive decline in rents that we kind of see all across the area. We see some decline in prices here in the middle, particularly in the center of the city, uh, but really it's big increases in prices all over the suburbs. And that was really something not many people anticipated coming into this pandemic, but we've seen just this enormous revival of suburban real estate. You can see kind of all across the Hamptons, into the Hudson Valley, into New Jersey, uh, just massive price increases in residential real estate. One point that I'll come back to in a second is that a lot of this price increase is actually in areas that previously people would have considered not commutable into the city. You know, these are areas an hour and a half away up into the Hudson Valley that previously you wouldn't have wanted to make that commute every single day. Um, but now it might be a little bit more feasible if you're making that same commute only, only every so often. So I'll come back to that in a little bit as we talk about how remote work is going to reshape residential patterns. But this is kind of the immediate price and rent impact that this pandemic has had in our immediate neighborhood. 
here's kind of another way of looking at that data to better understand how much this pandemic has really impacted urban areas. So I'm plotting here the distance from the center of the city from Grand Central. And every one of these X's is a zip code. And I'm plotting here the uh, log price change, basically the percentage change in price, as well as the percentage change in rents. So this is plotting out what is the change in prices and rents for different zip codes around the city as a function of distance, right? And historically, the pattern is that the stuff that's most central to the city, uh, stuff that's closer to Grand Central, the downtown areas has the highest price. And what we actually find is that those areas, those really proximate urban areas are seeing either you know, a flattening out of price or a big decline in rent, whereas it's those outskirts areas, those places further away from the center of the city that are really seeing the big increases in price. Now, there is a big difference here between rents and prices. So the pattern we see for prices is that they're you know, kind of flat, down a little bit in the city center, really increasing everywhere else. Whereas for rents, we kind of see that the center of the city is seeing these massive declines in rents. And I think that points out exactly at the temporary versus permanent aspect of this crisis. So the rents are basically picking up what's temporary, what's happening now, because you make your rental decision on a year to year basis. The prices are kind of telling us what might happen in the long run, because you're, where you buy your house, you know, how much you, money you spend for it kind of represents your long term expectations. So here's uh, kind of another way of looking at these trends and changes. Uh, again, I'm plotting the change in prices, the change in rents, all this is for our New York City area, um, relative to the price level or the rent level that we were in in 2019. So what this is basically telling you is that the most expensive areas are those places that saw the largest rent de decreases. And it's kind of the cheapest areas that saw the largest increases in prices, right? So we used to be paying this enormous premium to live in the densely packed urban areas. And we're not willing to pay that same premium anymore, um, especially when it comes to our rents. We're really not willing to pay that you know, $4,000 for that awesome Soho uh, loft anymore because the premium associated with urban living has kind of gone down a bit. So we kind of have collected this data, not just for New York City, but for all metropolitan areas around the country. And the way we kind of summarize this is to think about the gradient change. So that's basically the kind of the size of the, the slope of this kind of curve here. How much have rents or prices reversed along the dimension of urban v suburban, right? So a higher number here means that suburban properties are really increasing their price relative to urban properties. This is telling us these are the, you know, these areas higher up here are the places where suburban real estate is really hot. And these are the places where rental properties are really hot on the outskirts of the city relative to what's going on downtown. And New York, you can see, is a really interesting spot here. So it's high on both of these axes, meaning that there's been this big increase in desire for suburban living and both prices and rents. And it's also kind of high on this uh, x-axis here. So this is a measure of being able to work from home. So this measures the extent to which different metropolitan areas have greater industry compositions that lend themselves to being able to work from home. You can see our city is in a very interesting quadrant here on the top right. So we're basically a metropolitan area that has a lot of jobs that can be done remotely. And as a result, we're seeing this big increase in desire for suburban living relative to urban living. And you kind of see that directly in the plot I showed you where we have this massive increase for kind of suburban uh, price property. So, so where is this kind of coming from? So I think this is kind of an interesting sort of summary uh, survey that sort of illustrates how people are thinking about life in the long term. So this is a survey that asks people, what would you like to do in terms of your remote working preferences? So you can see that the kind of five days a week in the office that we were doing before this pandemic, actually only 10% of people want to do that. Now, the fully remote option, five days a week, you're sitting at a beach somewhere, that's you know, preferred by about 27% of people. So you can see really the vast majority of people are right here in the middle. They want to come to the office some number of a days a week, but they don't necessarily want to be there every day of the week, and they don't necessarily want to be fully remote. So I think this kind of pattern for what people are looking at post-pandemic is helping to explain why we see all this demand for real estate on the outskirts of cities, right? If you have that fixed commuting budget, if you're willing to spend a certain number of hours commuting, well, before you wouldn't have necessarily been willing to drive you know, an hour and a half you know, twice a day to get to your office. But if that's something you do once a week, twice a week, maybe you're willing to consider that Hamptons beachfront property. Now, that's kind of helps to explain some of these patterns within cities. There also is a good amount of migration across cities. 
So this is data from LinkedIn, which captures the migration of workers across different um, metropolitan areas. You can see that we're on the bottom here. So we've had this kind of substantial exodus of workers. Uh, SF is kind of in the same position. They also have a very you know, heavy tech industry, obviously, that is, lends itself to remote work. And people are kind of instead heading to a variety of cheaper metropolitan areas kind of all around the country. Um, kind of related to that, here's kind of a look at whether people are actually in the office or not. So New York here, um, latest data suggests that our office occupancy is about 15%. For SF, it's also relatively low. San Jose here is about 16%. Uh, SF is 13. Um, the Texas city is actually after that devastating storm or right, you know, right above average. So kind of connecting, you know, putting all these pieces together, we can kind of see that this pandemic has led to really massive temporary and permanent shocks. So the short run, we have these enormous changes in location. And that's kind of a combination of disease concerns in urban areas, the fact that everything's locked down and shut, so it's not as exciting to be in New York with all the Broadway shows. And you're kind of looking for you know, a little bit more space for your work from home setup. You don't really want to pay for that extra commute. And that's really been driving the rent decreases that we've been seeing in urban areas. The long run is not so dire, right? Prices have not declined as much as rents. And you know, we think that really reflects the long-term decisions people are making. But we have still collectively made these enormous investments in remote working technology. Some people will be 100% remote and work away. Other people will be remote working some of the time. And that opens up kind of a larger radius around the city that is a feasible commute window for individuals. So just to kind of wrap things up and think about the big picture, what this means for cities, you know, it's not as dire as it seems right now, right? The fact, again, the fact that these prices are holding up is positive for expectations. If we're going down a little bit in price, it's still going to be a very attractive city for young and creative people. The bad news, I think, is that cities can't expect people to pay through their nose for proximity alone, right? Cities really need to offer new and exciting things to retain residents because there's all of a sudden a competition that's opened up. And particularly that midtown office cluster, I think, is potentially in the crossfire with this new availability of remote work. The last concern I'm just going to highlight is a possible debt spiral. If we have declining revenue, worse public services, more urban flight, kind of in the 1970s. I don't think that's a likely outcome, but I think it's something that policymakers should certainly worry about and do their best to try to make sure New York remains a vibrant and exciting people place for people to live long term. Uh, and with that, I'm going to turn it over to Sam. Great. Thank you so much, Professor Gupta. Let me just share my screen here. And you should all be able to see uh, my deck now. Uh, just a, a quick uh, couple of uh, initial points. Uh, the first, uh, just uh, want to extend my thanks to everyone at Stern for the invitation to, to join you today um, and, and tell you a little bit about what we're seeing on the commercial side of the market. Uh, for students, uh, I've got a you know, very quick set of about 10 slides over here. Uh, I do update a, a deck that's you know, roughly 30 or 40 slides on commercial, 30 or 40 on residential, and 30 or 40 on the real estate economy broadly uh, that uh, I update about once a month and I'm delighted to share with all of you. Uh, some of it's just uh, interesting and good uh, refreshers and backgrounds for when you're going into interviews to get a quick sense of you know, what's going on in different aspects of, of the real estate market. So please just let me know uh, if you want the sort of expanded deck. Um, I think what you're also going to see in, in uh, my material is that a lot of the issues that Professor Gupta described uh, are the same ones that you know uh, the rest of us in the real estate industry are also uh, thinking about. Each of us approaches it with a slightly different analytical framework, but it comes down to two real really basic issues that are so relevant for New York right now. Uh, the, the first is this question of how will we use space, whether it is residential, whether it is commercial, thinking about how we use space um, and how uh, you know, our location preferences and the flexibility we have around where it is that we're working are going to influence space use and space utilization is one of the key issues for New York. The other uh, that Professor Gupta also mentioned, and that's foremost on my mind as well, is uh, ultimately this question of New York's competitiveness as a market in attracting highly skilled individuals um, and attracting uh, businesses. Um, and a lot of that has to do with uh, New York's fiscal competitiveness and urban fiscal policy. The sort of you know, that death spiral related to you know the strength of the agglomeration in New York City, uh, which I think a lot of people are very concerned has been impacted by the pandemic. As, as an initial point over here, I think for a lot of 2020, there were people in uh, the real estate market, certainly in the 
initial months of the pandemic who were really thinking about how it is that we would you know, be able to very quickly revert to pre-pandemic norms of behavior. And so this is my analytical framework that you're seeing here. Your short-term considerations that were underlying projections in 2020, keeping in mind that no economist is likely to also be an epidemiologist, a lot of dialogue with people in the healthcare community about the underlying trajectory of the pandemic itself, and are modeling three groups or classes of scenarios. Uh, ones that were you know, where we have a highly effective vaccine that is uh, uh, widely adopted, one that's highly uh, where we have a highly effective vaccine that sees uh, moderate adoption, and then a moderate, moderately effective vaccine that also has uh, only moderate to, to low adoption. I think where we found ourselves so far, you know, sort of is in the middle of this. We have a highly effective set of vaccines, which is more than I think any of us uh, might have hoped for at this point. We're uh, invariably facing some distribution in logistics channels. Uh, you know, there's some uh, there's variation in the perception of risk around some of these vaccines that's limiting adoption, um, and we see variation in that not only across the country but in different parts of the world as well. As we move into 2021, you know, there is some vaccine optimism uh, now that sort of, you know, we're, we're making real progress here. And uh, I think the dialogue in the real estate industry now falls into a set of scenarios that I group into three uh, categories. Again, from a you know, from an uh, econometric modeling perspective, how we translate this into actual modeling work with the data um, is uh, significantly more complicated than the industry dialogue um, and fraught with uh, the potential for error. But whether we're looking at retail, industrial, office, really looking at the potential applicability of three different groups of scenarios um, for analytical tractability. Uh, the first is a reversion scenario. In what segments of real estate do we observe a return to pre-pandemic patterns of behavior or processes? Um, and I will say that there is clearly some perspective bias at work in the real estate markets. Um, you know, my colleagues that own large numbers of office buildings seem to uh, fall into the reversion scenario camp, uh, where they think that uh, you know, remote working will play a more limited role and everyone is uh, very, very anxious uh, to get back into the office as many days a week as possible. Folks that don't own office buildings uh, tend to have uh, a different view. Uh, in the acceleration scenario, we're looking at uh, you know, those segments of the real estate market where we observe persistence of trends uh, that are accelerated by the pandemic. So you can imagine this being at play you know, in the retail sector. Um, you know, many of the underlying trends in retail also impacting sort of industrial warehouse distribution, fulfillment centers, you know, being accelerated uh, and no, no going back. And then finally, in the inflection scenario, given the duration of the pandemic, to what extent and in what which sectors do we observe uh, the emergence of new and ultimately persistent changes to behaviors and processes that fundamentally alter uh, or impact the way that we're using some types of space? So as a very quick sort of, you know, uh, longitudinal example here, you can see when we're talking about retail sales, you know, a big jump in online sales um, and a, a very, relatively modest drop in bricks and mortar. Part of the reason for this is that bricks and mortar over here, although it looks like a small drop relative to the increase in online, what that reflects is that online sales are, of course, a, a smaller share of the overall retail pie even today uh, as compared to bricks uh, and mortar. So the absolute changes uh, that you've got here are a little bit different from what you see in, in these relative adjustments. But you could imagine from an anecdotal perspective, what might we be talking about? And it's one of the questions that I sent along you know, for sharing in the breakout sessions. How will different types of retail respond to and adapt to changes? My parents would have never imagined buying their groceries online. And online grocery sales is one of the areas where we have seen very limited penetration outside of a couple of metro areas um, into the space that is dominated by bricks and mortar grocery. Uh, given the constraints of the pandemic, a much larger number of people buying groceries uh, online, uh, to what extent uh, does that newly adopted behavior actually persist, even after it's the case that uh, the underlying circumstances allow for us to go back to the grocery store as often or as freely as we would like. Uh, those behavioral issues are ones that are going to be really tough for economists to analyze, but I think ones that we're really digging into the data as much as possible uh, to assess. Um, Another way that we can look at this, and this is going to be exceptionally pertinent uh, for New York City. Uh, and, you know, I think all of us as economists have been dissatisfied with the frequency 
uh, and lags in our, our traditional data sources. And so we're looking at you know, uh, all sorts of uh, alternative or non-traditional sources that may, from which we can make inferences about you know, the behaviors of, of uh, consumer and business participants in the real estate market. Um, one of those things has been, as you can see in the example here, you know, what are people doing in terms of uh, transportation, mobility? You can see people driving, walking, uh, public transit not having recovered to the same degree. When we think about all of the drivers for the recovery of the office sector, you know, one of the things that I think we're all thinking about and sort of you know, we see covered in the paper, the competitive competitiveness of New York and retaining those and attracting those jobs and residents versus sort of you know, a large employer uh, of, of our students perhaps opening up a new office uh, or expanding in, in an area uh, like Southern Florida or, or in other parts of the Sun Belt. One of the things that we see at this point on an anecdotal basis in our comparative analysis is that the business resumption plans in major metropolitan areas around the United States are in fact being influenced by or, or tempered by the dependence upon the public transportation infrastructure. Um, and by this, uh, what I mean is that in markets like, let's say, in Austin or a Dallas, where we observe significant autonomy in the journey to work, people getting in cars uh, in professional occupations and having that autonomy over their journey to work, uh, and then companies sort of uh, having made sort of a, a sort of a meaningful set of adjustments in terms of the workplace environment, so that people are you know also feel comfortable when they're at work. Um, the way in which businesses are able to then engage in getting people back to the office is a little bit different from what we see in markets like New York City, uh, where there's an overwhelming dependence upon uh, the public transportation infrastructure as uh, the facilitator of that journey to work. And, and while the MTA and others may be able to show uh, that it is safe uh, to travel on the subway, there is uh, a behavioral element here where people feel a degree of anxiety, uh, and it is helping to shape, uh, you know, in a way that's to the detriment of of many businesses in New York, uh, the return to uh, the workplace. And so we see you know, some real variation there that is completely separate from all of the issues around. Uh, you know, the value of New York's, uh, uh, I don't want to say completely separate, but independent of some of the core issues we're thinking about when we're assessing and analyzing the value of the agglomeration uh, that, uh, you know, uh, from being located in New York City, as compared to uh, ultimately the costs, whether it be the cost of congestion, whether it be the cost of living, whether it be the taxation, uh, you know, the tax burden uh, that, that each of us uh, bears as an individual or as a business uh, from being located in New York City. So what is the broader market thing? You know, how is the market, what, what's the market's intuition about uh, what we see happening in uh, the world of real estate? And so here I'm just looking at reach sector returns as of the end of February compared to as my benchmark for pre-pandemic January uh, of last year. And what you can see is that amongst the core real estate asset classes, um, hotel in part um, is flat. Uh, but we have to dig in a little bit further. And what this reflects, because hotel is certainly the most significantly impacted in terms of uh, you know, cash flow, rising delinquency rates, uh, you know, there are no leases in place to provide for stability of cash flow. Uh, the hotel sector here is flat in part uh, because you know, the, the REITs reflect a relatively higher quality of asset. Um, you know, the REIT ownership of real estate is not representative of the underlying pool of real estate uh, in the United States. Office, you know, being uh, the the sector where we see the most significant discounts or you know the most significant negative returns, and that again reflecting sort of very real concerns around uh, you know the, uh, the 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 kind of data that we're reading in the slide that Professor Gupta uh, brought up. Now, I, I'm a big believer that we're going to go back to the office, that there is value in physical co-location, uh, but at the same time, I don't believe that we're going to need to be in the office every day to derive that benefit. Um, and so the flexibility around being able to work remotely sometimes um, is going to uh, you know, be a, a great benefit. Uh, and from a residential location perspective, as Professor Gupta described, if, think about it in very simple, practical terms. If, I, if my commute, when I leave the city to live you know, somewhere else is an hour and a half each way, the idea of doing that five days a week uh, is uh, just, uh, it's not something that I could possibly imagine doing. But if it's two or three days a week, then there is a larger geographic radius over which I can optimize my location decision. And to the extent that my utility function includes 
things other than minimizing my journey to work. If I have young kids, you know, part of my set of priorities is uh, access to and proximity to a good quality public school. Then you're going to see folks uh, optimizing over a larger geographic radius, even if they don't shift to a different metropolitan area. And that again comes back to Professor Gupta's description of there being a much wider range of commute times over which people are thinking about you know, what's relevant for you know, commutability if I'm doing it two or three days a work week versus five. Uh, we see in the residential and the retail sectors, you know, a lot of these are, are points for discussion where we can dig in on the nuance. Healthcare in the early part of the pandemic really was a surprise to a lot of people who were, uh, I think, sort of you know, uh, not digging in beyond what we were seeing with the overwhelmed emergency rooms and saying, oh my gosh, well, clearly people are using the hospitals. Here we're talking about potentially the impact of telemedicine on uh, the need for, uh, you know, for, for, uh, for uh, people to visit you know, the, their healthcare provider. Um, one of the things that's come up, and I'm gonna jump ahead here for a second, because I imagine I've run out of time uh, on these slides, but the, um, uh, this one is not showing up as intended. The, um, you know, one of the things that, um, uh, you know, that we're gonna see in the office sector is a lot of companies saying, well, although, um, you know, although I don't, uh, I'm not going to be bringing people in as often, I imagine that I'm going to need more space uh, than, than I have historically. But think about your basic production function here. If you need more space per person, then as an input to your production process, what has happened to the efficiency of this input? Um, and if the efficiency of that input, if you need more of this input for every person to produce the same level of output, are you going to pay more for that thing? Um, and the answer is probably not. And so what we're cautioning folks is that, you know, if firms are thinking about more creative ways of using their office space, if people are not coming in every day, then that should be reflected in changes uh, in the way that we see office space being designed and utilized and leveraged uh, that does uh, reduce the overall footprint or the overall profitability for every single square foot uh, in the office building. So that, that's a bit of a challenge. Now, I'm a big believer in New York. I'm gonna jump ahead over here. Again, we've got a lot of data that I'd be delighted to share. Some of this describes how you know, the availability of equity and debt financing uh, you know, has tightened up, is expected to remain tight, how we then view it as relatively undersupplied uh, in some markets, this data being from the ULI PWC survey. But where I really wanna close um, is uh, with these two slides. One showing from an attitudinal perspective, you know, what do folks in the market think about the role of remote working? And this again sort of is a restatement of, of what Professor Gupta shared. And you see that you know, in the future, more companies will allow remote working. You know, the overwhelming majority of real estate companies believe either agree or strongly agree. Uh, they also believe that we'll need more square footage. But again, think about the underlying economics of, of that demand. Ultimately, for New York City real estate, it then comes down to two really basic questions. The first being, how are changes around our ability to locate uh, across a broader geographic area because of uh, remote working and work location flexibility impacting the way that we think about and use space, whether it is the office space itself or the ground floor retail? that we leverage and take advantage of when we go into the office uh, for work or because we have a work lunch. Um, and then secondly, uh, New York's fiscal position and its competitiveness. New York, Boston, Baltimore, Philadelphia, these are fiscally relatively inefficient cities. And you can find charts and data on you know, the relative tax burden, whether it be property or income taxes of being located in, in any one of these markets. Um, what you're going to see is that this idea of the 15 minute city, if you can get everything you need within a 15 minute walk of home, that is undermining to the value of scale um, in a way that you know, presents a real challenge for a large city like New York. Uh, our fiscal position um, is uh, significantly impaired as compared to where we were uh, before the pandemic. Uh, it's significant, the outlook is significantly impaired as compared to you know, what the controller's office believed it was in November of 2020. And you can see that uh, in this chart. But the combination of the potential impact on uh, the perceived and real value of the agglomeration, the value to scale 
uh, if this idea of the 15 minute city, you know, has uh, has some traction um, and then sort of, you know, the, you know, the, uh, the, the benefit of being in New York City versus the tax cost, someone who did his uh, PhD in Philadelphia, I'm acutely aware of how, uh, you know, the, the, you know, the fiscal efficiency or inefficiency, you know, can have a, a deeply detrimental impact on the competitiveness of a city if you get the balance wrong. Um, and so it's something that I think is going to be a major challenge for New York City uh, and real estate in New York. And, but one that I also believe both in the private sector and potentially in the public sector, we have the wherewithal to navigate uh, if uh, you know, we uh, face up to you know, some of these challenges in, in a way that is uh, innovative and creative. Thanks very much. Thank you so much, uh, Professors Gupta and Chandan. Uh, we had a whole bunch of questions in the chat, but uh, if you'll indulge us, maybe we'll just take one or two. So a lot of these questions, um, I think, stem to uh, what I would call spillover issues to other industries. Uh, and a broad theme is in the questions is, you know, if we think about this change toward people living further outside of New York City, um, doing more remote work. And we assume that change is going to be, you know, maybe not permanent, but at least somewhat sticky, right? It's going to be at higher levels than it was before. You know, what are you, what do you see as the other industries that are going to be the real winners and losers? You know, who do you think is really going to benefit, and who do you really think is going to be be hurt in the long term? Professor Gupta, please. Um, yeah, I mean, I think the, the, you know, basically industries that can do remote work effectively, I think are going to be, uh, you know, enormous winners here. So I think that stems across, you know, kind of financial industries, uh, kind of the tech industry, obviously. And then even within it, I would say that there is a real opportunity for business models where you can figure out how to do remote work better than the other competition, right? So I think that's going to allow for firms that are really able to understand this new mode of working to kind of outcompete against uh, against others. And then in terms of you know other kind of industries that are negatively impacted, you know I think it's, it's just a real question mark over anything that is sort of in person and service related kind of for the foreseeable future. One thing that we saw after 9/11 and then the financial crisis was that air travel, for example, was just persistently low for many years after. It just took a really long time for air travel to pick up again. So I think there's a real possibility that all sorts of industries that are related to hospitality, tourism, are going to be really badly affected for possibly a persistent amount of time. But we'll just have to wait and see how, how much people kind of feel the aftershocks of this. Yeah, uh, I agree. And I'll add to that, that although we're thinking about remote working a lot of the time in terms of working from home, I think the idea of a distributed workforce uh, where there are certain tasks or functions that where individual people working you know, in a specific group may need to be co-located, but they don't necessarily need to be co-located with other functions. Um, and that really allowing for the phenomenon, which I think is giving you know, a lot of pause to people in New York, where we see sort of, again, major employers exploring Atlanta or you know, uh, Southern Florida or, uh, Nova or Las Vegas, Denver, Salt Lake you know, for that other office. Um, we think about sort of you know, the, the, the both in terms of individuals uh, working in a way that is distributed, but functions also working in a way that's distributed on the because I know there are a lot of real estate students uh, on the call. I'll also mention that you know, one of the areas where we see tremendous potential. Um, is that over the course of uh, the last decade, um, since uh, more than the last decade now, we've you know uh, since since the end of the housing boom and bust, you know a significant investment on the part of real estate developers and investors in high quality Class A urban housing opportunities, generally in the rental space, where we have seen uh, very very limited new additions to the inventory have been in um, uh, the areas of workforce and affordable housing, whether it's capital A or lowercase a affordable. Capital A affordable is difficult to get to pencil out because you've got limitations on income, but your costs are still very high uh, to actually develop. In the workforce space, which we think is you know, critical to a market like New York, uh, we need um, a wide range of housing options to ensure occupational diversity in the city. Um, you know, it impacts the long-term economic outlook if teachers, firemen, policemen, other people who serve the community cannot afford to actually reside in the communities that they serve. Uh, but these, uh, this, this area, workforce and affordable housing, is one where we've seen very limited development, uh, where uh, the market remains very supply constrained, uh, and where uh, you know, for those of you who may be interested in the multifamily space, we see a lot of opportunity.
Yeah, to that point, Professor Chen, and we had another question about a plan that I believe was put forward by Governor Cuomo to think about taking all of that uh, commercial office space that we now have in downtown New York City and perhaps transforming that into more affordable housing. Do you think that's something wise the government should be thinking about seriously at this point, or is that too premature? We need to wait a little longer to see how things evolve. It's it's a great question, and there's precedent for it. Uh, my own patron, uh, Larry Silverstein, you know, has uh, made it his work to to rebuild Lower Manhattan after 9/11. Um, but I think you know, one of the things that we saw shortly after 9/11 was the introduction of low cost financing through Liberty Bonds to actually convert a lot of the older vintage office buildings. Uh, that uh, you know, were located on Pearl Street, on J Street, on Wall Street, into um, uh, you know, in, in, you know for, for residential purposes. Changes in the highest and best use of some of these older assets are, are a natural part of the real estate life cycle. I think what we will see in uh, you know other parts of the city, you know, we we are we have been in the midst of uh, you know a historic building boom uh, in the office sector in New York over the course of the last cycle and, and hotels as well. But when you think about the additions in Lower Manhattan, um, you know, Hudson Yards, the largest private private sector development project in US history, a lot of extremely competitive and high quality office space coming into the market. Um, where we're feeling that uh, in the form of you know, uh, you know, uh, you know, lease migrations um, is uh, in some of the older stock. Um, and I think there is an opportunity there to alleviate some of the housing challenges that we face you know, across the boroughs of New York City by thinking about how we can leverage you know, agency financing, FHA financing, uh, to provide a, a broader range of, of housing options for uh, for New York families. Yeah, I just want to piggyback on that and say, you know, I completely agree that there is an incredible opportunity here for reconversions of space and an important role for policy, particularly around mortgage financing to help support that. One thing I just kind of want to add is, you know, my own experience of being in New York this last year, if you just kind of walk around the city, you go to Midtown, it's completely dead, right? Any of you that have been to Midtown this last year know that there's nothing going on there. But at the same time, if you go to the Lower East Side, you go to Williamsburg, you'll see that we have this new Open Streets Initiative that has been a phenomenal way to use more of our street space. You know, back to the point Sam just said, you know, the highest and best use for our streets is not like free parking for cars, right? It's being able to better use that space in ways that actually benefits people to be able to sit outside and really enjoy the space. And so, you know, the way that New Yorkers can have took to that model so readily, I think shows that there is an incredible, you know, need to have a city that's really focusing on the people that live here and work here. And I think that is gonna be a much more viable base for the city going forward than the old commuting model where you just rely on people living in Connecticut, living in New Jersey to compute here and try to kind of tax them anyway, which is gonna be another kind of fiscal battle heading in the future. So I think you know, we want to be respectful of your time, but I'd like to end with just one last question. Uh, the person who posed this question sort of noted that it was sort of half a joke question, but also half a serious question. And to be more kind of uh, provocative, I'm going to ask you each to provide maybe a one sentence answer to the question. So the question is this, uh, kind of summing up across everything you know about New York City real estate and how things have changed. What would your advice be to one of our students who currently owns an apartment in New York City? Do they sell it now or do they hold on to it and try to ride things out? Go ahead. <laughs> I, I, th I think I'm gonna go out here and say, I think this is the bottom of the market from the residential standpoint. I think it's gonna be an uphill uh, climb here for, for prices is my, my bold. Yeah, uh, I, I'd agree. People have uh, foretold the, the, the death of New York before, uh, but uh, uh, I would hold on to the asset. All right, well, this concludes the Q&A portion. Uh, thank you so much, Professors Gupta and Professor Chandon uh, for such interesting talks and spending some time with us today. So I really wanna thank everyone for joining. Uh, we'll look forward to seeing you back next week. We'll be having a second Faculty Insight. We'll be focusing on the future of technology. Thanks so much, everybody.